<clears throat> Good morning from New York City. It's raining today. Not too hot, comfortable. Not good motorcycle weather though. And um, Tiger Woods didn't win the British Open. Neither did Rory McIlroy. Molinari won it, okay? The others were following behind, but it was best, best showing for Tiger Woods since, I guess, since the wife hit him, or the ex-wife. Anyway, we were, yesterday we were working on working out the density of the universe. Well, of course, that means the mass and the volume and the radius and a bunch of things using only elementary principles. Now, a common strand throughout that is the escape velocity. Now, the escape velocity can be used as per John Mitchell to derive the Schwarzschild radius. Now, all of this stuff was re resurrected again using general relativity in the Schwarzschild solution. You don't need that. I like to use elementary principles by the correspondence principle. They have to be valid, right, for their realm of behavior. If general relativity does not reduce to Newton's gravity, it is wrong, okay? If um, string theory does not reduce to, let's say, supergravity, and supergravity reduced to general relativity, and general relativity reduced to Newtonian mechanics, then string theory is wrong. I have my doubts about string theory anyway, because it hasn't really predicted new stuff. In fact, I have my doubts about supersymmetry, because it's been around now since 1974, and Vladimir Akilov was on my uh, dissertation committee when I was doing my PhD. I was hoping he might get an L Nobel Prize, but it's been a long time now, and nothing special has happened from supersymmetry. It's a nice mathematical artifact, but I don't think nature respects it, all right? Now, okay, so the elementary, con the elementary constants measurable, necessary to do this stuff, however, are Newton's constant, 6.67 by 10 to the power of minus 11 Newton meters squared over kilograms squared, the force of gravity between two separate kilograms, a distance of one meter apart, okay, it's a small force. First measured by Cavendish, Henry Cavendish, in 1798. Speed of light. Measured many times. Galileo fa failed to measure it. It was too quick for him. Uh, I guess it was Romer who first measured it accurately using the moons of Jupiter. But Christian Huygens measured it too, many people. And then, of course, in recent times, you can measure it yourself, even at, at home, using your television. H. Write that down. When you see H quoted, it's always written as 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's great if you're an astronomer looking through a telescope. If you're calculating little problems at home with physics, using physics, you want SI basic units. So, this we worked out yesterday, or could have been the day before. I certainly worked it out in previous lectures. You just put in for a parsec and then make it a million parsecs, and a kilometer becomes a thousand kilometers, and just do the units. And you get this. So using these things, but also we use the escape velocity. So I de de derived the expression for the density two different ways. I'm going to show you today why really they are the same way, but not just yet. Uh, now, uh, Mr. White Bohr, decently enough of him, I don't know his name, he's one of my subscribers, pointed out yesterday when I thought I made a mistake that I didn't. And as rightly so he pointed out, I worked out the mass density of the universe and I was thinking energy density for some stupid reason which needed a C squared in it. I didn't need it. He pointed out that the result was actually correct. So I'm going to do it again. So first things first, we had, um, what did we have? Well we had uh, V equals HR, so at the end of the universe, the edge of the universe, the Hitchhiker's Galaxy has a restaurant at the edge of the universe, all right? So at the edge of the universe, where V equals C, the escape velocity is the speed of light. And all the galaxies receding away from us turn out to be now at the edge of the universe at the speed of light. Why is that the edge of the universe? Because we cannot retrieve information if there is a galaxy going further than the edge. In other words, traveling at a speed greater than the speed of light, it could be. But we cannot get information from that. Light doesn't come to us from it. It's going too fast, okay? Now those speeds were measured and graphed by Hubble in relation to the distance from us. And he used the redshift formula. You can find the speed of something. Even an ambulance going down the street. 
using the red shift. Doppler shift, when the ambulance is coming at you, you hear a high pitch. When it's going away from you, you hear a low pitch. If that was light coming at you, it would be blue. Going away would be red. Red shift means going away, none of the galaxies are coming at us. Now what's happening? So, we're going to make a simple model of the universe where its radius increases like that. And all the galaxies on the surface here, that surface, is actually the Schwarzschild radius of the universe. And R is the radial scale function of the universe. And you have to look at, look at Susskind's lectures on that, because I don't have time to go into it. So this scaling radius it's talking about a speed. Now, there could be speeds this way and that way, but we're not interested in components sideways. Components only in the R direction. Well, the speed of this surface is dr by dt, rv, right? And r dot max is c, the one we have over here. Now we worked out the radius of the universe as well yesterday. But let's look at this. H is not really a constant, it's a particular value right now, but it's dynamical. H will take to have the expression r dot over r. Now, if you want to integrate that, you get a log. We carry out that cal calculation another day. So what do we have? We have the mass of the universe. is c squared r over 2g. I'll just substitute in the c over h and I'll get c cubed over 2gh. Now we have the volume of the universe. And we put in for the r again right here. And we have the density. We've worked out the volume and the mass. Density is mass over volume. Here's the mass over this. C cubed, sorry. And we get an expression for the density of the universe because we'll cancel the, that and we don't get the C's. The C's are not in it. We get one power of h, okay, is that right, h squared over 8 pi g, there has to be an expression for density in here, all right, no there doesn't, so am I missing something? Let me check. Oh yes, there should be a three here. Four over three. So this is an expression for the density. Now I found that by assuming that the Schwarzschild radius of the universe exists for r equals c over h, and that we have such a Schwarzschild radius, and of course it's based on Hubble's law, and that we know g 
H and C, and we don't even need to know C for this, because it cancelled out. Right, that's the first way we found the expression for the density of the universe. Let's do it now using the Friedman equation case K equals zero. That's the way it's done by cosmologists. So we derive the Friedman equation, which is normally derived using I'll put it down here. I'll leave it there. Normally arrived using general relativity and the field equations. So now let's do it a different way. So now we have the universe. Once again, it is rescaled radially by R of t. And we found that h is r dot over r. r dot means the derivative of r with respect to time. And r dot is this, this guy taking the derivative of r. So now we have the escape velocity. Equate the potential energy to the kinetic energy is how you do the, find the escape velocity. I've done this before in elementary physics, high school stuff. The ends cancel due to the equivalence principle. And I get an expression for v squared. v squared, of course, is r dot squared. r dot squared is the radial speed that we're interested in. OK? Now, we need to get the Friedman equation for k equals 0. How did I do it the last time? I have to put in for m. Well, m is 4 over, cube, 4 over 3 pi r cubed rho. And this is the case of the Friedman equation for r equals, sorry, for k equals 0. And one power of r cancels. So that's r dot. And straight away we can get the same expression by solving for rho. I'll divide across by that. Let's do that now, actually. r dot over r times 3 over 8 pi g uh, is equal to rho. This is squared. So now I'll move over here and write the same expression. So we have, that is h, so that's going to be h squared. I get the exact same expression. And you say, well, you got the ex same expression using the Friedman equation. I did the analysis the exact same way. It's not clear that I did it the same way because I said I'm deriving the Friedman equation, but I used the same thing. I used the escape velocity to derive the Friedman equation. But really, that's what I did in the first derivation. See? So I'm tripping over myself. It's kind of a cheat. You can look at it either way you want. But you get an expression, a really neat one, for the density of the universe. Now, usually there'll be another thing with k here if you want to do the full Friedman equation. But, you know, k is almost zero for our case in the real universe because we are flat almost. So that's good enough. So let's put in some numbers to that now. That's the expression we got for the density of the universe. We don't need these. Now 
Now, in the, pre in the first case, of course, I used the definition of density equals mass over volume. In this case here, I didn't have to do that. But that's also covered too, because I got rid of the density, sorry, I got rid of the mass in the equation by substituting in 4 over 3 pi r cubed rho. So that really is how it, how it happened to be the same expression. So now we put in all the numbers. Now this is going to be kilograms over meters cubed. I'm not bothering to trade hang around with all the units. 2 times 3 choose a 6, so that's 6.9 times 10 to the power of minus 36 plus 11. That's gone. Over 8 pi times 6.67. Now I actually calculated that already. So I get for this, sorry, that's not kilograms. Kilograms per cubic meter, 4.1 by 10 to the power of minus 27. Let's think about that number. Now, 1.67 divided into that is uh, 2.465. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that every cubic meter in the universe, on average cubic meter, contains approximately 2.465, two and a half, let's say, protons. Well, that's not entirely true, really, because throughout the universe, there is radiation. I mean to find the, dennis, the density, the radiation density of the universe as well, as a separate exercise. This density is all-encompassing. Everything that's in there, masses of photons, if there's such a thing, but the energy of them in, in terms of mass. Um, there could be neutrons, of course, electrons, any other particles that are stray hanging around there. People talk about dark energy and dark matter. I don't fully understand that. Also, I don't understand the horizon problem. As far as I'm concerned, there is no horizon problem. And I'll explain that in a separate lecture someday, okay? So, uh, now this is a very interesting result. 10 to the power of minus 27. That's no accident, right? We are counting protons. How come it's not 10 to the power of 57? 10 to the power of negative 57? 10 to the power of 80? Um, if I take the whole volume of the universe and divide by this number, sorry, the whole mass of the universe divide by this number, I should get a very interesting number, 10 to the power of 80 actually, particles in the universe. That's known as, is it Vile's number? However, it's one of the early guys' number. So this is a very interesting little talk, and there's more, that's enough for this lecture.